And you can visualize just how chaotic it gets uh, in terms of how long any given ping pong ball can sit at rest before it gets triggered by another ball. And now think about that in terms of like your human attention. Think about that in terms of social media. Think about that in terms of needing the ability to have a bit of cognitive autonomy. And you see that by turning this connectivity, you turn the connectivity arbitrarily, just like Kaufman showed, it's very likely to reduce the ability that that collective has for retaining adaptive information. This podcast is entertainment, not financial tax or legal advice. Views expressed represent statements of the speaker in their individual capacity, do not represent the views of Unchained, and should not be considered investment advice. Speakers often have personal family or business connections to Unchained, which may include direct financial benefits. Please see our disclosure at unchained.com slash podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Frontier podcast. This week, we have on Matt Perkowski. Matt, welcome. Thanks, Joe. Good to be here. Yeah. Glad to have you here. Um, for those that may not have heard you on a podcast or, or follow you on Twitter, what's your background and, and how did you originally get interested? Sure. Yeah. My background, kind of a, a winding road pursuing my my various interests has taken me to a number of places in my life. But um, a lot of that started you know, with a deep interest in continuously asking why and trying to trying to get to the bottom of questions and, and you know going in life where that led me. Uh, my background in education was in evolutionary biology and psychology. Uh, I did some work with uh, primates back in college, and um, you know that was actually in the domain of behavioral economics and trying to understand how uh, you know to what extent they shared certain uh, what we call what we might call biases in terms of our own economic behavior. Uh, trying to teach these primates to use money, use monetary symbols, tokens, um, engage with them in trading behaviors, uh, and observe various aspects of that. And you know, th this started opening up numerous questions for me. I mean, I, I became very interested in uh, sort of continuity with respect to evolution, uh, how these different tendencies of our behavior um, persist, even though the, the species evolve and, and develop all sorts of new features or complexity or behavior. I mean, we descend... Uh, we, we separated from those monkeys you know, over 6 million years ago, uh, and yet there's this continuity of, of various aspects of the way we perceive value and, and relate to one another via transaction, trade, and representation. Um, and so I became very interested in that. I became very interested in that uh, and also tried to simulate that, which led me to you know, learn a lot of programming. Um, I ended up going into the private sector uh, as opposed to continuing academia. I became a software engineer, a uh, software architect. Um, that took me through a number of companies. You know, people will be familiar with uh, Netflix was one of them, uh, but I also did a lot of independent consulting. Um, and I've always been very fascinated uh, by the interface between that evolutionary psychology I was studying and the way in which our systems interact with uh, those systems can be our technological systems or things like monetary systems, which we will discuss later. Um, and you know, through that lens, I had been keeping track of, and I was also to some extent... Um, let's say libertarian adjacent in that 2004 to 2008 time during my college years. And so you know, I was keeping track of, of what was happening and, and saw some of the, the emergence of Bitcoin. And uh, it was right in the wheelhouse of that sort of intersection between evolution, evolutionary psychology, value representation, um, digital transformations and technology and human behavior. And so, you know, my interest was, was, was very much attracted to that. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't also, uh, purchase or, or mine a lot of Bitcoin at that time. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but my interest was at least attracted to it. And so I've been, I've been interested in it as a, as a form of um, technological realization of the way we deal with value, uh, express value, transact value, um, and, and, and communicate value as, as a species. Um, and so, so that was kind of like the, the history of that. Awesome. Yeah. Great to hear. Yeah, on your your Twitter bio, you say one of your like phrases is bringing order to chaos and chaos to order, and I think that plays kind of a role in like your background in studying systems. What did you mean by 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 that phrase? So it's 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 kind of a pointer to some of the elements we might unpack later in terms of seeing the world as a process and an unfolding process. Uh, one could ask, how many ways are there? to interpret that phrase. Uh, this would relate to, or you might then notice that there are a number of symmetries in that phrase, right? There are symmetries simultaneously in, in the, the, the sort of duality of order to chaos and chaos to order. And these are also these primary polarities in terms of the archetypal ways we have represented 
um, you know, the, the, the extremes of our social emergent, uh, systems, you know, you can have, or, or generally, you know, we can look at physics as well. We can talk about chaos being these states of almost complete disorder. And then we can talk about highly ordered states and, and we can ask questions about how these emerged and then also how they persist. And then to what extent are they likely to fall back into disorder, uh, to go from order back to chaos, uh, or from chaos to order. And so, you know, in that statement, there's a reflection of, of simultaneously, you know, these dualities, uh, they reflect upon one another. And then also you can ask, you know, if I say bringing order to chaos, you know, one could say that I'm taking an order system and bringing it to a state of chaos. Or one can say I'm taking order and bringing it into chaos to bring order. Um, so there are a number of ways to actually parse and reflect um, that sentence. <laughs> and I think that uh, there's no there's no right way to do it. It's highly context dependent, but it's something to keep in mind as as a kind of heuristic whenever you're looking at a system. And uh, you know, that, I, I try to keep that frame of reference where I try to understand that there is there is dynamic structure to this world, uh, but it's also highly context dependent and, and constantly shifting between these various states. And it's not always obvious where you are, uh, but but symmetry can be our guide oftentimes. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure we'll dive deeper into that that phrase um, as we go forward. But this is a very big, broad question, and I'm curious to see how you're going to take it. But what is money? Like, what is money to you? Yeah, I mean, that that is that, that's perhaps, you know, that's, that's, that's an extremely broad question. Uh, money is you know, obviously, uh, we use words, we use words to point at processes in the world. And um I think this is probably a good opportunity to introduce people to some of the the core aspects of my thinking that might differ from how people are used to thinking about um, things in the world, let's say, uh, or the way that we use language to point to things in the world. So, you know, I'm very much, I'm my, my thinking is very much informed by uh, emergence. So uh, trying to look at the world as a process of bottom-up synthesis, uh, the emergence of new aspects or affordances from previous uh, simpler dynamics into more uh, increasingly uh, complex or ordered dynamics. So like there's this, there's this emergent perspective and, and those that intersects with also, you know, a, a focus on processes as opposed to substances. So we could talk about, you know, when we say, what is money? Uh, you know, we could say, okay, we're talking about a, a thing or a, a set of things in the world. Uh, and these are kind of like artifacts that we can observe, we can touch, we can hold. Um, but it also like, yeah, that's a byproduct of an underlying process. And there's this interesting question as to what is more real. Uh, it's a philosophical question that goes back quite some time. What is more real? Uh, the underlying substances that give rise to process, the underlying processes that give rise to substances, or the substances that we that we can see in the world that are produced by processes. And you know, the going back to the sort of duality that we were just talking about in terms of my bio quote, I don't have a you know, I'm not going to take a single side on that matter, but I do think that in our current position in 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 our social, cultural, and evolutionary history, uh, we do, uh, it is required that we take a lot of the sort of top-down analytic perspectives that we have assembled uh, about the world and about the objects in the world. Um, you know, through our scientific process, we have cata you know, cataloged, categorized, and studied uh, in, a, in, a, in a largely sort of dissective or reductive way, uh, a lot of the world's complexity. And we come to know a lot about the world, but that has also left us with a, a need to uh, create frameworks or create perspectives that can synthesize that uh, bottom up once again. Um, and so, so I'm interested in, in that perspective. And so uh, maybe like a, a neutral example that actually isn't related to money, but that might give people an idea of what I mean when I talk about those abstractions I was just talking about is, is like, if you were to ask me, what are footprints? Right. Um, and, and I could tell you like, you know, a footprint uh, is, is a impression in the ground. Um, they, have certain shapes. That's a feature of them or a property of them. Uh, they have a, a size range that they typically, um, you know, fall within. Um, they can come in different kinds of patterns, depending on the amount of legs or the, the cadence at which an animal might be moving. Um, you, and then we, we can talk a lot about the, the properties of, of the actual, uh, footprints themselves, but then we can also ask a series of questions that is like, okay, well, what, what generated them? Okay. Well, we have, categories of animals that have the ability to move around in the world uh, upon limbs. Um, this entails a, a number of, you know, th this actually tells us something about the world, which means, okay, there are, there are certain kinds of living creatures that have to move around. Uh, and that's actually interesting because there are other forms of life that don't necessarily move around. Like the, the, the entire plant world is a world of life that actually um, explores the domain of, of being able to live while being fixed in place or mostly fixed in place. 
Um, and so we can we can sort of peel this onion or like go deeper and deeper into these questions um, with respect to you know, what is it about the world that is giving rise to the footprints on the ground that we're seeing when we ask the question, what is footprints? Or we can talk about you know just the limited descriptions of the qualities of those footprints. And so when you say what is money, oftentimes you'll get an answer that talks about things like uh, you know units of account or the ability to facilitate you know, exchange or store value, or it's divisibility or it's fungibility or you know, all of these properties. And those are properties that are a lot like describing the properties of the footprint. But, but we have to also ask these questions. I and mean, what I'm really interested in doing is asking the questions that, that speak to what is it about uh, the nature of these deeper processes in our biology as a species, as, a, as, a, as an organism, about the kind of organism that we are, um, that gives rise to the emergence of something like money. And then what role does money play from that perspective? And from that perspective, you know, you will notice that, um, you know, I, I, I would just, you know, I'll put this out there and then I'll, I'll try to explain it. You know, I, I would put money uh, in the category of, of things like language as well, right? And I, I call these coherence mechanisms. And the reason I use the word coherence is because we are a social organism. We simultaneously, you know, at all times, have a tension between the way we experience the, the world as individuals the way that we come into direct contact with the world as individuals, right? The, the collective, the, the, the community has no capacity to directly perceive the world. It must perceive the world through each of its individuals. Each of its individuals has eyes, it has ears, it has hands, it has the ability to move through the world to gain information, to model the world, to reveal information and, and causal structure of the world through its local experiences and movements through the world, right? But Simultaneously, if those entities, if those uh, each individual had no ability to share what they learned, uh, to ladder that up, um, to to combine the fragments of the models that they produce in the world through their movement and interaction, movement through the world and interaction with the world, uh, you know, we would not have any of the technology we see around us. We would not have uh, any of the complexity that we have been able to generate as uh, as a species, whose you know you might call our fundamental niche. Uh, being sort of general modelers of reality itself, right? So we we model reality itself in a number of ways, and uh, if we want to think of this as you know these coherence mechanisms, you know, if we wanted a, a simplification, uh, we can think about the dimensions of those coherence mechanisms. You know, you've probably seen political compasses where you have two dimensions and you can then plot on that. Um, you know, I think two, the two two relevant dimensions here uh, would be something like. Uh, fidelity of representation of the world. Like whenever we use a virtual, uh, whenever you we use one of these coherence mechanisms, whether it's money or language, uh, there's an ex there's the question of like, okay, how accurately or how tightly coupled with the actual dynamics of the world itself is that representation? So that would be this, you know, uh, the, the, this uh, fidelity dimension. And then there would be a dimension of expressivity. So like, depending on the system you're using to represent the world, how expressive is that? So the more tightly constrained, you know, the less expressive in, in some ways. And then, you know, the more you uh, create expressivity, the further away you can go from that, you know, from reality itself in a lot of ways. So, so like think about um, mathematics, you know, a mathematics, I would, I would say is another one of these, these coherence mechanisms that we use to intermediate our perspectives with one another and model the world. Uh, mathematics is high, uh, it, it seeks to be high fidelity, and in its axioms, it has very low expressivity. It, it produces very, very specific axioms or rules, uh, simple sets, you know, like Euclidean geometry, five of them, only five. And, and you can create an entire universe of, of structure and proofs, some of which map very well to the world, some of which, you know, may or may not. Like there's an entire world of possibilities of mathematical structure. Um, language, uh, the kind of language we're using now, uh, if we apply logic or if we if we constrain ourselves to trying to represent the world accurately uh, as a as an agreement between us um, then we can try to, to hew towards using language toward you know for that purpose but i can just as easily say you know there's a purple elephant sitting above my head right now right i can say those words because language allows me to communicate that to you you now may have an image of that in your mind right you can imagine that possibility but it doesn't mean that in physical actuality that that is the case. So we can see there that we get this gain in expressivity dimension, um, but we also move away from from direct representations, a direct fidelity.
of, 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 of the world itself. Now, money is interesting in the sense that uh, money isn't just one point in that space between fidelity uh, or in, in that space of dimensions uh, of fidelity and expressivity. Uh, there are regions and we have some some leeway there, right? In terms of things like if you use gold, you have, uh, let's say, higher fidelity because you're, you're, you're binding yourself to material structure of reality uh, and the constraints that come along with that in a number of ways. Uh, and so because you are doing that, you typically also have um, you know, relatively low expressivity. All, all money is like relatively low expressivity right now because fundamentally you know, we're mapping reality to a number line, to the reals, right? We're saying like you know, $1, $1.50 uh, or you know, 100 yen or you know, 5.3 Bitcoin or 2.2 Ethereum, right? Like whatever we're doing there, when we, when we map that, we're mapping it to a single dimension. And so you know, when we map the entire world to this dimension, um, we, we are sort of constraining expressivity there and then we have this degree of um, we have this degree of fidelity, and you know, there's an interesting question in terms of if you, if you release the constraints on um, you know binding to reality, like let's say you move away from gold when we went off the gold standard. You know, this is an interesting question about you know many many in the Bitcoin community. You know, much discussion has been had of fiat, right? Well, fiat means that fundamentally you place the responsibility for managing that that fidelity, that mapping between symbol and reality, you place the responsibility within a human system, a system of governance. You give the system governance responsibility uh, and authority to maintain that relationship. Uh, and you know, while that may provide some short-term advantages, uh, you know, all of the uh, pathologies of human psychology also begin to manifest within that system. So long story short, you know, th this is kind of how I would think about, you know, the space of money, what money does for us as a system of expression, allowing us to uh, model the world, especially that part of the world where we're trying to uh, account for the flow and transaction um, of, of actual, you know, real goods and services that are essential to uh, the life process. So, um, so yeah, that, that's sort of like a high level uh, some high level surface area there. Uh, happy to dig into any part of that, expand on any part of that, clarify any part of that, or or go anywhere from here that that seems reasonable. Yeah, no, that was very interesting. Um, it is a, it's very like interesting to think about money because I think most people in the world today probably don't really think about money, and then like some people think like oh money has these specific properties, and then you're like taking the step deeper of like actually the world is a lot more complicated than it looks and those properties emerge from i guess behaviors and stuff like that so quite fast from yeah from fundamental constraints that apply to uh in many ways the nature of life as a process that must uh constantly find energy and that also always produces entropy and that also uh the kind of life that we are which is a social organism that simultaneously has to balance those uh, individual capacities of interaction with reality, but also gains from stitching those together collectively to create better representations that we can share and use together um, to to facilitate our creative abilities. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's that element of emergence in money uh, is absolutely necessary. And as as you note, um, when something is working, <laughs> we don't notice it typically, right? Like we tend to notice things uh, most frequently. If they are, you know, except unless you're like a, a weird kind of person, um, which I, I don't use that pejoratively because I also, I think I am kind of that weird kind of person. Um, but, but typically like if something's working, if it's functioning properly for, for the purposes at hand, uh, it doesn't warrant immense investigation and attention. But, you know, one of the reasons I think why obviously we have been, uh, consider, I mean, you know, look at the initial message in, you know, the, the, the Genesis block of Bitcoin, right. Um, you know, what does that relate to? Well, what, what world events were going on? Uh, yeah, obviously, this whole creation of the uh, of Bitcoin itself as an infrastructure, the perceived necessity for something like it was a response to the instability and pathologies of the concept or implementation of money as a relationship mediated between political systems and reality, right? The kind of, you know, it was a response to the kind of pathologies that creep in, the kind of manipulations, abuses, um, and and parasitism that begins to take over the system when the money isn't fundamentally a function of some uh, underlying physical fidelity. So yeah, very cool. How how do you think about various 
like specific monies. Like, like in my mind, if, you know, all humans spoke their own unique language, then language would effectively probably not be very useful because we all cannot communicate. So like we kind of have to converge on specific monies and specific languages. How do you think about that? Because now we have you know, fiat money. Now we have Bitcoin. Now we have gold. Now we have other cryptos. How do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that it, the the history of money, uh, again, we, we go to this question of constraints are something that drive behavior and drive the evolution of systems. But constraints in the environment can also change over time based on the dynamics of the system. So money, one of the things that if you, if you think about money, when you say everyone, if everyone spoke their own, you know, the, the Tower of Babel problem, if everyone spoke their own language, there would be no communication, right? There needs to be some level of um, standardization or emergent uh, resonance, uh, parsability, comprehensibility between the agents um, for, for there to be any transference of information or value between those agents. So, you know, if we talk about uh, the physical world of, of social interaction before any kind of digital communication or digital communication infrastructure, and we tend to gloss over that as if it's not something absolutely and immensely transformative, there is nothing more transformative than the ability to connect every single human at the speed of light to one another in real time continuously. That is a fundamental change in the nature of our species that does not get enough attention. Uh, but before this, uh, before this, there was an entirely different set of constraints that applied to human behavior. Uh, and those had a lot to do with the physical nature and limits of our interactions. So you wanted to actually exchange goods that you didn't have available in your particular household or your town or your you know, any of these local contexts. You had to go to a place where uh, you know people had... Uh, Oftentimes, by way or, or because of the fact that there was a convenient geography, likely having to do with the fact that waterways flowed near uh, those areas and, and actually allowed for a kind of natural networking of physical systems, you know, you would come to a literal confluence of, of, of the actual world itself where humanity had also then created a kind of mirror of that natural confluence and produced trading locations at that confluence, right? And and if you're trying to use actual money there, um, you have to have a degree of fungibility, right? This is this in interoperability question. Um, and so there's there's a selective pressure at play there. That selective pressure selects against high degrees of local nuance, local detail. Um, also, it selects against kinds of monies that aren't going to be, or that are easily forgeable, right? Um, so, so, so for example, if you're gonna go to a market like this and interact with a bunch of other cultures, and let's say that you are, um, let's say that you are uh, an Inca and in your local town, you have something that's called a kipu, uh, which is a, a necklace that's simultaneously a ritualistic artifact, but it's also an accounting ledger based on the way that the knots are tied in these strings, signaling different information and accounting uh, the various levels of bounty in terms of harvest across different years, different sorts of investments or transactions or gifts in the society that can all be symbolized in that kipu. But are you going to be able to take that to a location that uh, that people from other cultures who don't share the meaning or the grammar or the ability to parse or value that history? Because if you take that history to another location, what utility is the history besides the utility of the string, right? So, so this is this question of, of 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 marginal utility, marginal value. Like it actually is dependent on the context and the use and the information. Because in the place where that kipu came from. That contextual information is actually useful. You could use it to uh, to sort of navigate the social landscape. You could use it to perhaps infer aspects about the planting schedule or the weather or you know a number of other factors. But but that's not entirely fungible. You can't bring that to the market and, and expect someone else to value that aspect of the keep. And so you select for aspects of fungibility, aspects, material aspects of the monetary um, of the monetary base that have a, a set of properties that are fungible across this entire space. Um, and, and in a world of physicality, where you don't have the ability to arbitrage information across space and time very quickly, uh, that selects toward a, a very low dimensionality of representation uh, for money. And, and now we live in a world that's sort of at the end of that process. And that world has all of its monies uh, mapped to one dimensional number lines, right? Uh, and and it's actually pretty amazing that we can create the amount of complexity that we can uh, 
through the transactional, um, through the information that emerges um, based on transactions uh, that give us data points on that single number line in, in many spaces. I kind of think of that as like a, a point to list image. If you think of like pointillism, where you make an image out of a bunch of different dots and up close, it just looks like a bunch of dots. But if you zoom out, you can actually see an image emerge. Well, that's a pricing function, right? Like that's kind of how pricing works. Uh, that's Hayek, you know, that's Hayek's point. You know, a lot of the Austrian economists, um, you know, get us to think about even in its reduced state to one dimension, there can be a very rich set of signals and information uh, if you are able to get those sort of zoomed out views of, of, of what's being you know, communicated by that uh, distributed computation of humanity over all of those transactions using the one dimensional number line. This still does not solve the problem of the fact that some information, some context specific, potentially useful, that Kipu kind of information, that it's still throwing out that information, right? Um, and 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 maybe that information is useful, even if it's not represented in our current monetary systems. Well, this is one of the biggest changes that I think has occurred with the aspect or the invention of or the explorations that we're doing now with digital money. Um, you know, a little bit less so in the world of Bitcoin, a little bit more so in the world of you know, uh, you know proof of stake or other forms of money that are experimenting with uh, much higher dimensional ways of representing value uh, in the world uh, and, and and trying to figure out, well, are there ways of representing community specific or context specific, domain specific value uh, that even if those people are not co-located, uh, that value can have some degree of utility uh, or fungibility, even if it's not global, even if it's not useful across all scenarios. And so that allows us to, to turn up that dimensionality. I don't think you know, it's not going to be infinite dimensionality. Like you still, you, the, the Tower of Babel problem still applies, but you might be able to turn up the dimensionality in context specific locations or for purposes that could benefit from the passage of more information across these communication systems that used to be, or that had to previously be mapped all the way down into one dimension. Um, now, I don't think that replaces the, the fundamental um, need for monies that have high fidelity and a high binding strength to reality. We can get into that maybe with proof of stake and proof of work stuff. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's kind of, this is kind of the lens I see this through. Yeah. It's, it's definitely very fascinating. Let's definitely dive into, into that, whether it's, you know, proof of work versus proof of stake or Bitcoin versus something like Ethereum. How, how do you think about those two systems? Yeah. Um, so again, I think, I think it's very important to, <clears throat> to not, to not confuse ourselves by by looking at both of those systems as indirect competition for the same ecological niche or function. And I think that is a mistake that is happening and that that is like almost characteristic of the tension between uh, the two, uh, let's say, I'll use the word communities loosely, but between those two communities. Um, when we're talking about something like proof of work, uh, we're talking about something that is much more of a I, I've called these kind of mechanisms uh, binding closures. Uh, if you look at the the emergence of life itself, or if you look at the emergence of social complexity, oftentimes you will see certain mechanisms that can tap into a uh, a gradient of potential, potential energy typically, right? And they can do so in a stable way that transforms that gradient into some new ability to do work in a very general sense. And, you know, for example, in biologic, in the history of, of biology, um, uh, the, the, the mitochondrion, uh, which, which seems as if it was essentially, you know, one eukaryote somehow consuming another eukaryote and, and then, you know, that, that other, or sorry, one eukaryote, I think consuming a prokaryote and that, 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 that entity essentially becoming internalized as a, uh, as a, as an organ, right? So like, uh, something that was able to, or that had the ability to um, transform or basically create a gradient of energy based on uh, very fundamental mechanisms such as such as protons, right? Like we have these series of proteins embedded in the mitochondria that through their chain of interactions actually produces a, an energy gradient, a stable gradient across that membrane and also byproducts that are useful for a much wider range of chemical processes in the body. It opens up a whole new space of potential creation or synthesis or fabrication. Um, and, and similarly, like if you go up the stack, way up the stack to human society, you know, an example I like to use is, is something like a water wheel, 
uh, human societies noticed there's a natural gravitational gradient. Water is flowing. Uh, is there a way that we could do something with that water other than you know just just use it for transportation or conveyance? Well, you know, if we created a mechanism, you know, if we used our mind to imagine a mechanism that transformed the potential of that water from its mostly linear flow into a kind of rotational energy and that rotational access, that rotational energy, if it could be interchanged with a set of systems on the other side of that uh, or, or directed into a set of other uh, maybe linear momentum for sawing or, you know, rotational momentum for grinding flour or, or grinding wheat into flour, we could transform one set of general potential, one general potential into a whole realm of uh, actual uh, forms of useful work, right? So you transform a gradient of potential into a free energy source. And by free energy, I'm talking technically in the thermodynamic sense, uh, energy that can be used for work. Uh, you transform it into energy that can be used for work. And that allows you to uh, generate a bunch of new processes that are the, the, the functions of useful work. So you can grind your flour, you can bake your bread, you can more easily saw the wood you need. You can do a bunch of things that you couldn't have otherwise done. Um, now we get into this question of once you have that potential, once you have created a new mechanism, that new mech that, that binding closure, that new mechanism opens up an entire space of possibility in terms of, well, how do you use those new capacities that you have? How do you link them together? How do those linkages actually come into functional relationship with not just one another, but with the environment in which they exist, right? And how, how sustainable is that? How adaptive is that new network combination of potentials? Um, and, and that experimentation of how those human linkages and those human incentives and that structure that is now enabled within that space, uh, I, that, that's actually much more analogous to the exploration that's happening in, in proof of work, right? Or in proof of stake right now. Um, in proof of stake, you know, what are we doing? Well, I think it's a mistake to think about the fact that we're just trying to secure a blockchain in, 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 the, in the proof of stake domain. Um, it, it's not a coincidence that the, the question of governance is a much more integral question in the proof of stake domain. Fundamentally, we are introducing humans into these, um, we could call them into the loop, but it, it's a much more complex network than that. A network of incentives, a network of desired uh, values. So if you think of, so if, you know, for example, linking up um, uh, voting mechanisms within DAOs to proof of stake mechanisms to regulate certain kind of penalties that you might uh, operationalize over, uh, over over block validators or things of that nature, right? Like there are all sorts of ways that we are now experimenting with how we are organizing the potential in this new space of monetary representation, this new space of communication, you know, this new space where we've 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 opened up the allowable dimensions of expression for our for, for symbols that can simultaneously act as as coordinating mechanisms in communities um, as well as that are fungible with other um, that are fungible with other assets um, and we're, we're exploring that space much as life explores uh, those spaces when new affordances are created so you, know, you can think of you know especially for crypto I, I like to think of I think I've been in this for a while, so I think 2017 is, is is interesting to me because you know you have this ICO explosion, uh, very analogous to like the, the Cambrian explosion, and I think that you know a lot of people will say this is where the, the, the term shitcoiner really emerged, right? And and why do we call or why do people call it a shitcoiner? Uh, well, oftentimes it's because of the fact that this the failure rate is extremely high. Uh, there were a lot of parasitic dynamics going on. Uh, there were a lot of uh, exploration of niches, right, to try to figure out this new space of capital injection uh, that that alleviated a lot of the prior constraints in terms of trying to get capital allocated to a particular um, hypothesis about value generation in the economy. Uh, you know, all of the constraints were simultaneously released, and there were there were actors of goodwill, and there are companies and there are initiatives that came out of that that still exist to that day, and that. That are that are continuing to this day to try to uh, realize their mission and their function in the world. Um, but like any any new ecological niche that is going to be explored, uh, there is an immense amount of parasitism and immense amount of failure. Uh, I mean, look at if you look at the Cambrian explosion, there's this immense radiance. We we developed 
you can, you know, eukaryotic cells. We developed the ability to, you know, encapsulate uh, our DNA and and also develop more cellular specialization because of that. So we had this nuclear stru- nuclear structure. We had this eukaryotic structure, and immediately that eukaryotic structure went to try to figure out how it could relate to every possible niche that it could find, right? And so you got this immense amount of diversity and pathology and death, right? And then you had this, you know, basically this crash as certain linkages, as certain ways of networking that potential together, prove themselves to actually be able to make a living much more consistently and in a much more stable way than others. And that was a very tiny fraction, right? Very tiny fraction, which is why we saw the, the diversity that was expressed in the initial phase of the Cambrian explosion drop to a much smaller fraction of that initial diversity expressed that that continued and became the platform for the rest of life. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of, this is how I look at proof of work and proof of stake. I look at these mechanisms and I see in Bitcoin, I see something that uh, created a new binding to uh, an energy gradient, like a very natural energy gradient in order to create a very stable um, mechanism that allowed us to coordinate or begin coordinating around something that was not predictable by decree or by fiat or by human collaboration, but predictable by mechanism, uh, by, by the, the genuine brilliance of the design such that the mechanism itself is highly self-sustaining and highly stable and simultaneously uh, really deeply taps into something quite real, which is the need to provide energy and computation um, over that system such that that system can continue to function and attract uh, and attract attention and attract human energy and coordination, coordinative potential. Uh, and that anchors a new entire space of potential exploration. Like I, I'm in the camp where I do not believe that. I, I think if you kill Bitcoin, um, everything except the authoritarian use of cryptocurrency by states will die, right? Uh, it, you know, immediately you will have a, a massive incentive for capture of the rest of this space and because none of that space exists outside the domain of human collaboration, coordination, and governance, right? In the way that energy fundamentally does, and these incentives and these mechanisms fundamentally exist outside of governance, beyond governance, attached to something much more fundamental than even humanity itself, uh, because that exists now, it opens a space that allows for a kind of experimentation that governance governments would simply not allow if it were not. Uh, if it were not something that existed beyond them, um, which is why I think of it as a, a, a sort of like supra, uh, supra Westphalian or supra governmental entity, the, the, the first one that we've truly created as a species. Um, so that's sort of like my general framework for how I, for how I see those two poles of this space of experimentation, uh, and I, I don't really see them as this defined by proof of work or stake. I see them as sort of different and complementary aspects of this natural process of opening, you know, creating a mechanism that opens a new space of exploration. And then all the dynamics that try to find ways of making a living in that new space of exploration. Um, I know that's not normative or or standard or how most people see it, but uh, I think you can make a pretty strong case for it uh, from an emergent perspective. Let's take a quick moment to talk about the Unchained IRA. With the Bitcoin price moving above 40,000, the Unchained IRA is breaking records this month. With a Roth Bitcoin IRA, you don't pay capital gains on the appreciation of Bitcoin. Unchained offers a solution. They make it simple for you to set up a Bitcoin IRA while keeping control of your Bitcoin keys. Use code FRONTIER for $100 off and schedule your free consultation today at unchained.com slash IRA. Now back to the conversation. Yeah, now that's very interesting perspective. So would you, I guess, say that proof of stake systems like Ethereum are more in the exploratory phase. And like, we don't know necessarily like what's going to happen with them 10 years from now or or 20 years from now. Yeah. I mean, especially to the extent that, you know, it's moved to um, proof of stake in its entirety. Uh, You have systems that, you know, the flexibility that it affords is fundamentally, um, it fundamentally enables a broader surface area of exploration experimentation, which is why we see, you know, for example, you know, if you look at NFTs, well, you know, even though after a period of time, an aspect that is NFT like made its way into that fundamental um, layer, that fundamental uh, mechanism that is Bitcoin, the initial exploration and still the vast majority of, of functional 
experimentation functional potential exists, you know, for any NFTs at least, exists in the world of Ethereum. And, you know, that's because of the fact that the the mechanisms of Ethereum, you know, they are fun, the, the, these the culture, uh, the mechanisms, and the um, the entire purpose of that space, so to speak, is an exploratory purpose. Is trying to experiment with new, like with relatively low costs, uh, with entirely new possible spaces of possible design spaces of function that could, in theory, become self sustaining, right? Which is why you can literally out of nothing use the protocol to fabricate an entire space of coinage, right? An entire value space, right? By decree that then is supposed to act as an attractor for human behavior, energy, and function, right? Like what is the point of any of these, any of these coins, any, any of the things that we do on top of the Ethereum protocol, if it is not to try to bring into coordination and organization? new networks of human function that have some goal, right? Uh, and this is, you know, the, the idea of DAOs was, it was a very early idea in the emergence of Ethereum. Like it was almost there from the beginning in, in a sort of gestational manner, right? And and that's not, again, that's not random. That is a reflection of this aspiration to explore this new potential, um, this new potential that we have given ourselves. Um, if we allow ourselves to, uh, release a little bit of the fidelity that's required on on the side of like you know the if, if we have the the binding closure the the proof of work the Bitcoin mechanism on one end of that spectrum, which is basically it, its reason for being is to bind us to that energy gradient so that we have a, a stable anchor a stable cadence a stable heartbeat around which all this economic coordination can occur and depend on. Um, once we have that, then the question becomes. How do we leverage this to create new forms of human interaction, new systems of uh, organizational potential that takes advantage of the uh, the potential that we've created in terms of communications between humans at light speed um, and enable sort of non-local use of that information, that kind of keep who like information we were talking about before um, that enables that to have value in places in the world that that actually um, are focusing on sort of like an aligned set of, of vault values or goals or, or that are trying to realize some sort of similar outcome in the world. Um, and they can, and they can posit that and they can posit a hypothesis about how their network of function and social relations and incentives uh, can work uh, in relation to some sort of a coin or representation or set of NFTs or whatever. And that hypothesis can try to make its way in the world. And most don't just like most life forms and most mutations don't, right? Um, but the ones that that do, the ones that find genuinely novel, uh, self-sustaining modes of operation uh, that actually provide function or value in the world, uh, that actually helps bring us into a whole new, uh, a whole new space of, of social organization uh, and coordination that was just not available uh, in the in the world out of which our current forms of governance emerged. Yeah, very interesting. Um... This is a related question um, is from Dhruv on the Unchained team. And, and he wanted to ask you, if I gave you $1 million of value and you had to hold it untraded for 10 years, would you prefer that I give you Bitcoin or ETH? <laughs> well, I mean, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to divulge my, my specific, um, my specific holdings uh, in terms of the, the amount that I hold, but I can tell you that my behavior is, and it's not, for 10 years now, but let's say seven-ish years or so, um, actually maps pretty closely to that scenario. Uh, I don't trade. I have allocated capital across those two assets in a particular proportion and held it. Um, and, and it is, and I, and, I, and, I, and I haven't actually altered the proportion that much. So I actually, you know, it's, it's like probably about, um, in terms of my initial investment, right? Because like, the, the relative value in terms of dollars today has changed, right? Given the relative um, gain in, in Bitcoin versus Ethereum. But uh, when I invested, it was something al along the lines of uh, two thirds into Bitcoin and one third into Ethereum. And the reason that I did that in that way, and the reason that I don't really trade and I don't really like to play in the uh, in the game of, of, of much more transient, potentially high profit, but, but also high death rate, um, uh, uh, sort of DeFi 
uh, or is the same reason I didn't participate really much in ICO craze of 2017, which is that I prefer, I prefer, I prefer to invest in the foundational infrastructure. Um, I have a low time preference myself. I am not trying to maximize my profit. Um, I, I look at these as, as saving vehicles, as well as ways of investing and, and, and signaling a stable investment in a new way of new forms of human organization coordination. So, you know, I park capital in a particular location. I, I have put more in since then, but, um, and I have, I'm not saying I haven't liquidated anything. I mean, I have at, at certain moments that have made sense, but that's a small fraction of the total net, net asset value there. Um, so I, I personally, um, I see it as, you know, how, how do we invest in, or how do I invest in, uh, oftentimes the, the most conservative forms of the newest things happening in the world, right? Like I look at spaces that are actually, that are very novel, but I'm like, what are the most foundational layers in those spaces? You know, what, what are the most likely to be around, um, and, 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 and like what, what have shown, you know, what have shown themselves to be. Uh, the most stable thus far. What are the most people building on top of, right? Path dependence really comes into play here. Um, I think a lot of people underrate. Uh, people will talk about you know, network effects, but network effects are also a function of a path dependent behavior, right? Which is like, you know, everything at moment T plus one is a function of, of moment T. Um, and, and actually, uh, as those systems build inertia, it actually becomes harder and harder uh, to compete with, but also to, to change the, to change the dynamics, even if you might think that you have a, a better hypothesis. So yeah, I mean, I, I still think fundamentally that the first movers in these two primary domains of, um, of adaptive behavior that I've described, uh, adaptive emergence, let's say that I've described, I, I still think that at least for me, uh, those have been, those, you know, I don't see a huge need to, to invest outside of that, but that's also because I am trying to spend my time actually elsewhere. Mostly, I have a lot of other things that I'm doing, and I'm not trying to be an active investor. Like, I fully acknowledge that there's an entire world of strategies out there, and that for many people, taking more active roles that could be perfectly fine for them, especially if they want to dedicate a lot of time, energy, and emotional uh, emotional volatility into that. I don't, right? Like, I, I have a particular perspective. My perspective is long term perspective. Um, I'm busy doing other things mostly with my life, um, professionally and personally. And, and so that's, that's sort of my, my personal strategy. Yeah. I also agree with that. I think that's probably the right way to do it. I'm curious, how do you think about self-custody in relation to both of those systems? Does like those very complex systems, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake, and then the individuals interacting with those systems, is it important that like they self custody or how do you think about that? Hmm. Um, so without, you know, without, without trying to give away too, without giving away too much information, um, about, about my own personal behavior here. I mean, I do think that, I think that is, it, it is, I think maintaining autonomy and agency within systems is important. I think that, so if, if you, if we go all the way back to this question of the, the sort of, uh, individuated or, or sort of like each, each respective individual agents behavior, relative to collective behaviors and collective institutional dynamics. Uh, I, I think those are different worlds. I think that if you want to have, you know, there's going to be more, always more responsibility that comes along with that agency. Uh, and so if you want to have, if you want to be able to maintain your own sense of sovereignty or your own capacities that aren't fully dictated by the kinds of dynamics that emerge within institutions uh, or within principal agent relationships, right? If you, if you delegate your autonomy uh, by a trust relationship to a third party, um, you're obviously depending on a number of guarantees or the stability of, of, a, of a set of, let's say, protocols or um, uh, uh, legal policies, right? To ensure that behavior. Uh, I personally like to lean on um, I personally like to lean on mathematics and uh, and also um, an infrequency of actual connection with that space, right? Because I also do understand that there's a high degree of parasitism going on, a high degree of manipulation, a lot of people trying to persuade other people into making mistakes uh, with their transactions, with the way that they behave such that they can siphon off that money. So there's a sort of, uh, there's also a, uh, there's a penalty over ignorance, 
right? Uh, pretty steep penalty in many cases. And not just ignorance. There's also like a penalty in terms of like fatigue, even if you're just not looking uh, correctly or closely at particular uh, signals on your screen, you could potentially be tricked into uh, making incorrect decisions uh, or, or operating on information that is pathological. And so because of the fact that I'm a low frequency actor, right? Because of the fact that I'm not actually actively involved in a lot of trading, I prefer to basically have this, um, have these holdings as decoupled from that as possible. That being said, again, I understand that there are many other strategies. And if you are, if you want to be highly coupled, if you want to be interacting with uh, a lot of the other potential investments. If you want to be in the DeFi world, if you want to be, um, you know, using your Bitcoin as collateral, if you want to be doing all these kinds of things, that typically requires more connectivity, right? Like you have to actually have it in a. Uh, you, you have to. You, you, you typically you don't have to, but like. Most of the methods for doing that entail having more exposure um, to to agents. So, and I, I mean, like in the principal agent sense. So, you you have to have trust, or you have to have some system that allows you to to sort of have a gateway. And now, obviously, we have in addition to self custody, you know, we have more and more. You know, like, there's like Thorchain, and there's things that are that are coming online for uh, for providing a lot more uh, direct decentralization, a lot more direct uh, non intermediate non-intermediated agent to agent behavior um to the extent that that becomes more secure more dependable uh you know i'm i'm interested in it i mean obviously there's questions around things like lightning as well like to the extent that you want to be able to use uh something like layer one bitcoin as an actual um highly fungible um transaction mechanism day to day uh you have to obviously uh have some amount of that liquidity um in the network so that you know, and more than you're planning on transacting frequently or else it's just not convenient to use. Um, so, I mean, all this is highly context dependent. You know, I, I think about these questions, I would say definitely not constantly, <laughs> but I try to reevaluate these from time to time. Um, and I try to you know, understand uh, which way the wind is blowing as well. Because like to the extent also that the state makes it harder and harder for us to operationalize this capital in a liquid sense, like for example, if the U.S. were to go into a hyperinflationary mode, um, you know, is it going to be easier uh, or less easy to use and operationalize Bitcoin within the boundaries of that nation? Well, the state is going to turn up the pain, right? This is why you know I think their operations are literally called or have been called Operation Choke Point. It's like find the ways in which you can choke that flow out and attempt to do so in a number of ways using um, lawfare, using governance regulations, using the increase of friction over any given transaction by making everything a taxable event, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so to the extent that we can get beyond that as well, um, and we also have uh, proven trustworthy agents that are using mechanisms that take their trust beyond the domain of words and, and show that um, they actually can't violate their trust obligations, even if they wanted to, you know, I, I would put more and more of my capital into liquid spaces, but yeah. Yeah, um, I guess you would agree with this, but obviously Bitcoin is a is a money that can't be manipulated by a small group of people. As the world continues to to adopt Bitcoin and use it as like long-term savings technology, do you think, you know, the world and civilization as a system will change? Like, will there be smaller corporations or smaller governments? So, I mean, yeah. Um, smaller uh in terms of scale I mean, that's an interesting question i think I, I i first approach it in terms of questions like i think there will be so parasitism is less incentivized right so the and what i mean by that is you know if you think of um you know it, unfortunately people outside the bitcoin community are not as aware of you know something like the the Cantillon effect right um you know the idea that if you have a central location you know Rolling all the way back to our earlier point in the conversation where we were talking about fiat as 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 a a form of binding between uh, the the representations of value and our political systems that are quite subject to uh, human fallibility and corruption. Um, if we think about if we think about that corruptibility, we think about uh, you know that being a, a central point of corruption or a central attractor that attracts corrupt behavior. Um, you know, the Cantillon effect just describes the fact that. Uh, it makes economic sense for many people to try to move as close as they possibly can to the money printer, right? And that actually becomes its own economic game, 
right? And that has a cost because that actually takes human minds and human potential that could otherwise, under other incentives, be trying to generate, instead of focusing on, you know, on, on this game of who can get closest to the money printer, they could actually be focusing on value generating operations in the world. And they would be forced to focus more on, on actual productive behavior, right? And that's one of the, for me, that's one of the um, strongest arguments for any kind of monetary system that has a tight binding to reality is that to the extent that it is less manipulable, uh, corruptible, to the extent that it incentivizes less parasitism, that energy, that human energy and attention uh, tends to go into more productive activities. Now, obviously there are people, like there are people who are not on the margin and who are just going to, you know, they have a temperament or they have a history that leads them to, to be deeply parasitic in their behavior and their perspective on the world, right? And, and you know, the extent to which your monetary system can really change that, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I tend to fall on the side where like, I, I think that like there's some limit beyond which incentives, you know, can only do so much. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, I think that fundamentally, you know, then you can start to play this game of, well, what emerges from a change in incentives with respect to less parasitism? Well, okay, then our, our, our communication of the world, of, of the representations, because like if you have a parasitic game and it's a very profitable game for people to try to move closest to the money printer, you start getting all sorts of communication and deception uh, around that game because everyone's trying to essentially implement different types of signaling mechanisms that confuse other players of the same game. And so you get into this, you know, if you've ever played diplomacy or risk as a board game, you know, you can see that like when you have these very, uh, the central fixations of the sort of the, the primary utility function of that game, and it's a zero sum game, humans start to become very pathological and start to misrepresent reality. And I think there's an immense cost in misrepresenting reality because Think about like going back to the beginning of our conversation when we talk about like why did you know communication why do these coherence mechanisms exist why is language so important to us why is money so important to us why does mathematics suddenly something that helps us actually operate over the world well because there's because of that fidelity dimension actually does allow us to stitch together a map of the world it allows us to understand the world in ways that go beyond direct experience like i don't necessarily have to go to Paris to learn about Paris because I can benefit from people who actually felt and had incentives to represent it with at least some degree of fidelity, uh, either you know on the internet or in a book or in a historical narrative about how it became what it is, right? But to the extent that we create incentives in the world to, to defile that, to generate false realities because false realities can enable us to control other people, like if I can convince you that the world is something that it is in fact not, and the thing that I've convinced you of in your mind is to my advantage, okay, now I have leverage and control over you, right? And if that's what I seek, and if that's my prior priority, and if that's what we're all doing in the game that we're all playing, then the entire map that we use, that shared reality, that shared, uh, that shared mechanism of coherence, it disintegrates. And our entire capacity as a society to create value, to create uh, any any mechanisms, any any functional systems predicated on the need to interact functionally with reality itself, all of that goes away. All of it breaks down, right? And any systems that we introduce into the world that that pathologize our representations in that way produce the same effect, right? Whether those are political or ideological or monetary. Um, they all, to the extent they distort our ability or, or, or undermine our ability to generate these shares maps, shared maps with one another upon which our behavior depends, we, we lose our capacity for cooperative creation, right? And so, and so whether or not playing a game that incentivizes high fidelity representation and, and cooperative collaboration, uh, whether that reduces or increases the size of, of government I think that's an interesting question because I think you know, one of the things we're experimenting with, you know, relating to our earlier conversation about proof of stake, especially, is is what does government mean and what forms of governance are appropriate for what domains of behavior and does that look exactly like what it has looked like before or given that we have completely changed the nature of our species by introducing light speed real time communication <laughs> uh, between potentially everyone on Earth, uh, are there new uh, affordances available to us that that don't look like what they used to 
And so it, you know, it is bigger or smaller a good way to talk about that? I'm not sure. Um, I would hope that less parasitic um, and to the extent that they're less parasitically attractive, uh, they don't become these kinds of mass bureaucrat bureaucratic albatrosses around our, nest, our necks. Um, I think that's good. Um, I, I do think that there's always some role. Like if you look at emergent collective behavior, there's always going to be some need for a layer at which coordination can occur and that they can kind of sort of like feedback upon the emergent dynamics. So like we emerge, we have all of our tendencies bottom up, but we don't always agree. We get into arguments. We have local, we have differences in our local realities that actually lead to different desires and behaviors. And the, you know, meet the mediation of that, you know, the, the, the monetary mediation of that is, is one way of mediating that, but I don't think it's sufficient to mediate all human dispute or conflict. So, 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 so there always will emerge some superordinate layer that we must then use to, to mediate our conflict uh, to the extent that that can help to, to and, and sort of like the, the, the conclusion that flows from that is to the extent that we can do that effectively bottom up and to the extent that we can do that non-coercively, we reduce the degree to which we will tend to kill each other over these things. And like, if you know anything about humanity, you know anything about our evolution, that's a very strong tendency very strong tendency and it's very easy for us to fall back into that tendency especially when tribalism or, or like group phenomenology is activated and to the extent that we can, we can create these systems that allow us to mediate this uh, without falling back into that directly coercive resolution mode um you know, hopefully we can have a, a bit less of that on, on the planet and amongst us uh, I, I i'm not a utopian i don't think it's ever going to go fully away but but i do think you can i do think we can do better yeah, I mean, I agree. We can definitely do better. You you brought up the the fact that now eight billion people or, or so can you know communicate immediately with light speed, twenty four seven, three sixty five. Now, what are like some of the implications of that that might not be intuitive to most people? Uh, in a word uh, or two words, complexity catastrophe. It's a, a concept that I, I try to get out there to the extent that um, to the extent that I can. Uh, not my concept. It's uh, Stuart Kaufman, uh, a really brilliant biologist and you know, physicist, I would say as well, um, who, who you know, he, he worked a lot with the Santa Fe Institute, um, has done a lot of complexity research. Really, you know, one of his, his, his major tome was um, uh, Origins of Order, which is a book about the emergence of order and, and like how order introduces itself into the world, not just through evolution, but also through physical tendencies in the world. Um, he also, and in that book, um, in that book, he, he really did some really interesting, he was also one of the first people who did a lot of computational modeling of systems and, and network systems. And so in, in that book, you know, in some of his early studies, he created these things called, uh, NK adaptive landscapes and the N and the K, you know, what it basically symbolizes is the degree of these nodes, the amount of nodes, and then the amount of connectivity between these nodes and each node, you know, he was, he was operating in the, in the context when he was studying this in the context of genetic expression and in the context of, um, what is called epistatic interaction. And what that means is that you know, if a gene expresses itself, um, that gene can or cannot um, impact the expression of other genes, right? So you start getting a, a dependency graph, right? As any software engineer knows, one of the things that can cause a little bit of trouble in your dependency graphs is if you have dependency cycles. You have dependency, if, you, if you basically you get these dependency orderings that actually close in on one another or on themselves. Um, and But the interesting thing about it in genetic networks, like, that happens all the time. And that's called epistatic interaction. And he has this, you know, he asks this question in these graphs. And he's like, okay, well, if you look at a graph, is there a change as you change the amount of that epistatic interaction, the amount that any given expression or action of one gene can affect some number of other genes in their expression? Uh, does, as you turn that dial up, what changes? And one of the things that he really, what, that he found is that there's a critical threshold beyond which the ability of that genetic network to actually encode adaptive information completely deteriorates, melts away entirely. The genes themselves, by being overly connected to one another, by overly impacting one another, reduces the ability of that entire thing to learn, basically, right? And so, and so the lesson for us <laughs> is that uh, I, I, there, there, there's actually some interesting... Um, there's some interesting videos as well, like on YouTube, like uh, there's one that I think is a good visual, which is like, uh, there's a whole, um, 2d array on the ground of like a hundred by a hundred grid of, of mousetraps. 
maybe not 100, but it's a very large grid of mouse traps. Each on each one, there is a ping pong ball, right? Uh, and then if you throw a ping pong ball into that, it's basically like this this fission reaction, right? And so that's that's this visual representation of what happens when like even like one little interaction causes a chain reaction that causes reactions of each other trap. But imagine if those were like if those mouse traps tried to reset themselves, and so you kind of that game continued, right? Okay, well, so then you can imagine that the degree, the probability to which like one ping pong ball was likely to trigger like some other large number of ping pong balls uh, would be a similar metric to that other thing I was just talking about with respect to episodic interaction. And you can visualize just how chaotic it gets uh, in terms of how long any given ping pong ball can sit at rest before it gets triggered by another ball, right? Uh, now think about that in terms of like your human attention. Right? Think about that in terms of social media. Think about that in terms of needing the ability to have a bit of cognitive autonomy or a bit of time away from this to go deeper into a book or into historical context or into anything other than what is most emotionally salient and reactive in this exact moment, right? And you see that by turning this connectivity, if you turn up the connectivity arbitrarily or under the wrong incentives, namely incentives that actually treat human beings as a giant fission reactor for attention so that it can extract that attention as a monetary resource, which is exactly the financial incentive that we've created our social media interactions under. If you create that, just like Kaufman showed, it's very likely to reduce the ability that that collective has for retaining adaptive information. And I think that that is an essential insight that we need to keep with us as we move into the 21st century, uh, having gained the power to connect ourselves in the way that we have. I think I, I put this most simply, you know, for those who, the TLDR of everything that I just said, I had a tweet like maybe like four or five years ago. And it, it was something along the lines of, you know, we have connected all of our people cells overnight and are now having a seizure, right? The brain is able to function not because it is all connected and all firing at once. It is because the actual connectome, the actual structure and the actual sequence of relevant communication has been conditioned and structured over billions of years of evolution to actually coherently manifest behavior in relationship to its environment, right? It is not a random process. And to the extent that we make it more random, we tend to make it more dysfunctional um, if we go beyond a certain threshold. Now, there's an interesting threshold in between there. And that's the kind of threshold where we're, where we're experimenting with like psychedelic therapy and the kind of increased connectivity that tends certain times, uh, certain types of um, neurological connectivity uh, under uh, psychedelics, such as psilocybin or LSD. Um, that's a whole other interesting discussion because like some amount of, some, some amount of fluidity is desirable there. Uh, but like, we're not even monitoring this now. We don't even have this like metaphor in most people's minds in terms of like, this is what we're all partaking in. We're all putting ourselves in this giant fission reactor of attention. And, and then we're wondering why, oh my God, I, I, can't, I can't seem to read a book anymore. Right, like, I can't seem to focus for more than for more than twenty seconds on a thing anymore. Like, what's happening? Well, okay, when you are constantly plugged into that particular kind of attention reactor, that is a side effect of that, right? And so, so I think that like we need to have a better understanding of how information ladders up. I mean, this is why I'm such a big fan of, of, of emergent protocols on social media mechanisms, like in social media spaces that allow for us to do better, um, better self aggregation of value of perspectives, of relationships, qualifying, you know, how we feel about particular interactions with people that might not even be public, but might just guide the way that we are able to, you know, see information. Like we have very coarse grain mechanisms for doing this right now. Uh, they're, they're, in, they're insufficient. And also the incentives we're operating under, um, while it's a little better than it used to be, I think now, uh, still, still largely revolve around this kind of usage of users as a, uh, as an intentional fission reactor. So, yeah, I mean, what you just said to me is, fairly frightening. Um, so I guess you would say that modern social media, whether it's Twitter, X, Facebook, Instagram, is is kind of a big problem for society as they're built today. It has huge, it has huge potential. Uh, I think there's, there's simultaneously, like we have, we have, we've created immense potential and we've created immense danger uh, in those systems. And I think that it, it to the extent that we can um, seed them with mechanisms, better mechanisms that both protect personal autonomy and privacy, 
but also tilt the incentive landscape a little bit more toward uh, uh, emergence of um, emergence of insight, uh, emergence of, of syn synthesis of perspectives, uh, emergence of uh, developing better communicative capacity. Um, that would be that would be better than creating engines that generate a bunch of psychopaths. <laughs> <laughs> or the, well, that that bring out our psycho inner psychopath because we all have that potential right to different extents we all have it but like interacting with systems consistently that reinforce those behavioral tendencies and also while you know while simultaneously re removing us from context and removing us from uh from the ability to to go deeper into um explorations of of particular uh, you know things that show up on our radar and then actually pulling that thread for a long period of time to develop a sort of temporal understanding or more depth understanding, in addition to just sort of flitting around the surface of everything happening, um, you know, each moment uh, within these spaces. Because you know, to the extent that we we become that kind of a uh, of a of a mind, we sacrifice our individual cognitive autonomy and responsibility. And become much more like a, a hive mind operating on a gossip protocol, where we're much less, um, much less genuine, uh, genuine um, cognitive autonomy or consciousness even exists within each each agent. Um, you know. Nice. Yeah. Does that somehow tie back into self custody, right? Like having the the private keys and having that autonomy yourself, rather than trusting one entity with your Bitcoin or your ETH or, or whatnot. I think there's a parallel there. And I mean, I think you can see that parallel in the sense that, you know, that autonomy requires spending. It, it entails more responsibility. It requires understanding more about the world. It requires uh, a deeper perspective, right? It requires, um, and, and also it's more consonant with a, a way of a mode of behavior that is not in constant interaction with the rest of the system. Right, that takes a pause from time to time to separate into its own domain of cognitive autonomy to consider where you know it, it where it is going as a function of its own internal intrinsic or emergent um, perspective, um, unencumbered or, or or at least not at that moment inundated with all the signals coming from everyone else, right? Um, and and that amount of autonomy, and this goes back to this question of, I think the collective potential, the potential of the collective as a emergent organism, as a super organism, it actually is a function of the extent to which each of those individual agents, each of those individual parts of it that go explore the actual world itself, that actually have eyes and ears and hands and legs that actually go out into the world and bring back information uh, to the extent that those agents are actually autonomous, that they actually have minds of their own the collective organism, the emergent behavior benefits because you actually cover, like I've called this before, you know, sort of this like experiential aperture, right? Think of it like as your iris or something, like an aperture to the extent that you have more autonomy in each of these agents and they explore different parts of the world. The whole collective actually gets more information about the world. Whereas if you generate a hive mind or you have a totalitarian, um, a totalitarian state that is using things like the social credit system to slowly but surely homogenize the perspective of all of the agents within it, uh, that actually narrows that experiential aperture because the way in which every single agent is interacting with the world is homogenous and or increasingly homogenous. And, and therefore, it actually generates far less perspectival information uh, than, than would otherwise be the case. And over long enough periods of time, that's a significant evolutionary and social and governmental risk, right? So, and then maybe that leads to all sorts of other interesting questions about, you know, the extent to which that's being experimented with in different, different places in the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like personal autonomy and sovereignty and the mechanisms by which we implement this in the world, uh, it's a very important, um, essential integral uh, aspect of, of, of where we're headed and the balance of the balance, um, between, uh, autonomy and, and that sort of like, um, collective perception or collective uh, thought, hive mind tendencies, that balance is going to be uh, a critical balance moving forward in the 21st century. I, I think it's, it, it might be sort of like the inflection balance, you know, the balance on which our inflection point in terms of whether we have a, a an adaptive uh, future in which we are able to retain as individuals some degree of uh, perceptual, cognitive, 
sovereignty uh, versus versus a future in which those politicians or leaders who actually do wish uh, to to impose highly homogenous perspectives via technologies, especially the synthesis of financial technologies and artificial intelligence technologies uh, to monitor every thought, every action, every transaction, and and coerce those to conform to a very specific rubric of, of their desired behavior, one perspective, right? One totalitarian uh, extension of their will. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's more real of a threat than it ever has been and more possible than it has or ever has been given the technologies we're creating right now. So, so yeah, it's something, something for us to keep in mind as we decide the extent to which we exercise our autonomy every day. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely quite fascinating. Um, this might be like where we need to wrap it up, at least for today. I know there's so many other topics and questions that we could talk about. Is there anything based on our, our conversation today that I didn't ask you or that you have another point that you want to make that, you know, I could have uh, encouraged you to say, or like, what are your final thoughts? You know, I think my final, I think the conversation was wonderful. There's always other directions we could go. We covered a lot of surface area. I think, you know, my final thoughts are just kind of something like it's always worth, at least for me, I would encourage people to try to, uh, when they're looking at the world, you know, maybe not all the time, but uh, at times just experiment with the ability or to, uh, to to flip the world on its head and think of things from the emergent perspective, uh, think of things from the perspective of, of processes. You know, what, what gave rise to what I'm seeing? Uh, what are the underlying constraints? What are the underlying tendencies? Where did this come from, right? How much of this is something that's specific to what I'm seeing and, and how much of this actually extends much deeper as a, as a general uh, as a general constraint or process that has been driving or shaping behavior for for much longer periods of time, and I think the more we can actually do that, the more we can begin to exert uh, and bring into the world uh, the kind of wisdom uh, that we now need to complement uh, the, the much more popular ways of, of of talking about and thinking about the world today. Yeah, it's definitely a fascinating uh, to to listen to you. I think I'm definitely gonna have to go rewatch this again and and learn more from it because this was really cool, unique perspective that I definitely haven't quite heard before. Listening to a number of podcasts, so Matt, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for the opportunity, Joe. Look forward to uh, talking again soon.